Well now, our new book at bedtime is the latest book by the acclaimed author Lynn Truss. Cat Out of Hell is a gothic horror which may just keep you awake. The reader is Mike Grady. The following story, which is absolutely true, was brought to my attention when I was holidaying recently on the coast of North Norfolk. The month was January. I was in search of silence and tranquility. I had rented a cottage which provided a fine view of the deserted nearby seashore, on which my small brown dog could run in safety. Having recently suffered the loss of my dear wife, I chose the location with care. Isolation was precisely what I required, for I was liable to sudden bouts of uncontrollable emotion and wished not to be the cause of distress or discomfort in others. For a week or two, I was glad to be alone there, to make the fire, cook simple meals, watch the dog running in happy circles at the far-off water's edge and weep freely in private whenever the need overcame me. But I forgot that I would need mental stimulus. At the end of Michaelmas term, I had bid farewell to my position at the library in Cambridge with few real regrets. The work had been mechanical for quite some time, and I had assumed I would not miss it. I remember debating whether to pack my laptop. This is strange to think of now. Had I not brought it with me, perhaps the following story would never have been told. But pack it I did, and one stormy evening, when the wind was moaning in the chimney and I was craving intellectual occupation, I suddenly remembered that, around the close of the year, a library member of small acquaintance had sent to me by email the following folder of documents and other files under the general title, Roger. I opened it gratefully, and for several hours afterwards, I was transported by its contents. By turns I was confused, suspicious, impatient and even cynical. The story therein conveyed was outlandish, not to say preposterous, and yet, as I continued to study the material over the ensuing days, I felt increasingly inclined to believe it. Sad to say, I think what finally convinced me of the file's veracity was the staggering stupidity of the man named throughout as Wiggy, through whose pitifully inadequate understanding these events are mainly delivered to us. As my wife would have said, you couldn't make him up. Naturally, I wondered on occasion what lay behind Dr. Winterton's decision to send this material to me. But being unable to make contact with him, no wife I hear, I was bound to accept the most likely explanation— I had rented a lonely cottage at the seaside. Winterton had somehow heard tell of it. He knew that this story unfolded in a similarly lonely cottage by the sea. Though I often tried to picture Dr. Winterton, I found that I could capture only in my mind's eye a fleeting impression of a snaggle tooth and a hollow, unshaven cheek. And possibly, oddly, the smell of cloves. In former times I would have asked Mary, of course, she had been my colleague at the library for the past twenty years. Even though her position was part-time, she had paid lively attention to the members in a way that I would sometimes find bewildering. I believe she did once mention Winterton to me in particular, but she would be unsurprised to learn that I could now recollect nothing of the circumstances of her dealings with him. For several years she was in charge of allocating the carols, in the great reading-room, so perhaps it was related to that. She was the most wonderful, practical and rational woman, my dear Mary. She would never have taken this simple cottage. She would have been instantly alive to all its frustrating inconveniences. But she would have laughed with sheer pleasure to see our dog running so happily on the deserted shore. Every time he does it, I feel her loss most dreadfully. 
After long consideration, I have decided to present this material exactly in the order I encountered it myself. Who is Roger? Wait and see. The written files, including some rather pointless and silly dramatic efforts, are by the man calling himself Wiggy. Descriptions of photographs and transcripts of the audio files are by me. Roger, Screenplay 1 by Wiggy The kitchen of a coastal cottage on a gusty night. Scary stuff. Windows rattle. A kettle steams, having just been boiled. There is a sense of awkwardness reflected in the music. Under a pool of yellow light at the kitchen table, a digital audio recorder is glinting. Facing each other at the table, their backs in shadow, are Wiggy and Roger. Close up on the recorder, it is recording. Close up on wall clock, it is 11.45. Close up on window. It's very dark. Wiggy shudders. He is a handsome man in his mid-thirties, attractive and serious. Roger stares, breathes. Music now suggestive of heartbeats. Wiggy speaks first. Wiggy, shall we start? Roger, whenever you like. JPEG DSC-00546 The picture shows an unremarkable moggy-type cat, tabby and white, white face and bib, white paws, tabby back, tail and ears, quite hefty, harmless-looking. He is lying in the arms of a tall, striking woman in a grubby artist's smock, her long brown hair lifted by a sea breeze. She is smiling. At her feet is a small brown terrier of attractive appearance, whose tongue is hanging out. Behind is a flint and brick cottage, the name Shingle Cottage, visible on the lintel. Roger Thoughts by Wiggy Where to start? The crazy thing? Or Joe? Well, Joe, obviously Joe. I mean, where the hell is she? You can't just disappear. There I was, Coventry, Belgrade Theatre, four o'clock-ish, Thursday afternoon, just going on in the second half of the matinee of See How They Run. Call for you, said Alice, the ASM. I didn't have to take it, but I did. Thank God I did. It's Joe, sounding weird. Wiggy, she says. Wiggy, please come. It's Roger. You've got to help me take care of him. Or something like that, but I can't be exactly sure. Well, I was a bit distracted. We were building up to the bit where Jeff says, Sergeant, arrest most of these vicars, and it's important to concentrate, and my big sister is calling me at work to talk about looking after a cat. Joe, I'll have to call you back, I said. I handed the phone back to Alice and made my entrance through the French doors, just in time, I might add. Anyway, after the curtain, I called the cottage, like the decent chap I am, but no luck. I kept trying to call her for the next couple of days. At the end of the week, I just drove down here... And, of course, there's no sign of her, or even of Mad Dog Jeremy, who's normally so glad to see me. Even as I drove up the muddy lane from that bloody village, it felt all wrong. Her car sitting on the soggy grass across from the house, big gate open, back door unlocked, handbag in the hall, Jeremy's collar and lead hanging from the peg, mobile phone plugged into the charger in the kitchen, heating on. It felt like she just popped out. It still feels like she's just popped out, and I've been here four days. Don't know what to do, apart from write this. I did ring the police yesterday, and a detective called Sergeant Duggan came round and took a statement. I explained that Joe had called me at the theatre to say look after the cat, and he was quite cross with me then, because what she said suggested she was intending to go away. But she hasn't gone away. What it feels like, I didn't say this to Sergeant Duggan, but what it feels like is that she's been taken by aliens. And it also feels like the abduction happened within the last half hour. I keep expecting the Jake dog to come trotting past, asking for a pat. I keep expecting chairs to be still warm when I sit down, and sometimes I get a real start when they are warm, Roger having just hopped down when he heard me coming. A really perverse cat, Roger. Since I first got here, there's been this sort of 
scratching noise from the wall with the fireplace in it, and you'd think, as a cat, he'd be desperate to investigate. But he's laying there, calmly, in Joe's high-backed chair, swinging his tail and ignoring it absolutely. The policeman asked if he could look at Joe's mobile, and of course that was clever of him, so I said yes. But although it was still plugged into the charger, it turned out to have sort of died. And when he picked it up, he said, Ugh! and dropped it. It was all sticky, he said. Anyway, he reckoned I should take it into Worthing to see what could be retrieved from the SIM card. God, I hate all that kind of stuff. And he helped me to use rubber gloves to put it in a plastic bag. I have to admit it. He was much more observant than me. I suppose it's the training. In Joe's studio upstairs, he found a half-finished watercolour of Roger and heaps of sketches for it all over the floor. I hadn't noticed. He also asked about a pair of binoculars and a notebook with times noted down in it right by the window next to an old cold mug of tea. Tuesday, 10.05, next door garden, partial, that kind of thing. Joe, being a bird watcher, was news to me. He asked if anything significant had changed in Joe's life recently, and I said, well, yes, Roger. And he seemed quite annoyed with me again for not saying anything about Roger earlier. He made a note of the name and drew a circle round it and asked for a surname, which was when I realised he thought Roger was a lover or a murder suspect. So I quickly explained that Roger was a cat, and he crossed it out. So I didn't explain she'd only had Roger a few months. Took him in when her old Chelsea Arts Club chum Michael died in Lincolnshire, falling downstairs. Likewise, I didn't draw attention to the way Roger had definitely made himself at home here. He was sitting in the lane as I approached in the car. When he saw me coming, he just stood up, stretched, and trotted indoors. Now, this is the crazy bit. Maybe I shouldn't even write it down. I was sitting at the kitchen table last night, drinking some of Joe's impressive stock of cheap pink plonk, and Roger was clawing at the back door, wanting me to open it for him. And I suppose I was in a bit of a trance. I mean, it's very unsettling not knowing where Joe is. I've checked her computer and her diary, which felt really awful, really wrong. I didn't say this to Plod for obvious reasons, but I've also checked all the grass in the area for telltale scorch marks, because in my opinion, alien abduction is emerging as by far the most likely explanation. So, anyway, I'm ignoring Roger, like I said, and he's saying meow, meow, meow at the door. Maybe I imagined it. Maybe I did, but what happens is this. He suddenly jumps up on the table, sits down in front of me, puts a paw over my glass and says distinctly, let me out. I look at him. I feel a tingly in my head. I look at the paw. He doesn't move it. We look into each other's eyes for about ten seconds. And then he jumps back down on the floor and claws at the door again, saying, Meow! Meow! Let me out! Meow! Let me out! Audio 1 In your own time, says Wiggy. I picture Wiggy as a feckless type, of course, an actor in silly farces in provincial theatres. He went to a good school, floppy hair, I shouldn't wonder, mustard-coloured corduroys at weekends. The following is a faithful transcription of what can be clearly heard in the file marked Audio 1. Essentially, it is Roger's life story, told in his own words. I have long since ceased to care that every aspect of this monologue is technically utterly impossible. If it's helpful to know, Roger does sound a bit like Vincent Price. I was born in 1927 in the East End of London, and before you tell me that's impossible, Wiggy, May I remind you that a cat talking into this recording device is impossible enough, but I think you will agree that it is nevertheless definitely occurring. 
My mother was very beautiful and very young. I never knew my father, but that's pretty standard for cats, so please don't bother trying to read much into it, although I have to admit that a sort of father fixation with its associated rejection issues has arguably been a theme of my whole life. Have you read much Freud? Uh, no, Wiggy says. My brothers and I learned to scavenge and hunt, he goes on. There were four of us, all born together, but we were reduced to three when my brother Bill was killed by a cart horse when we were six months old. There is a pause. Wiggy starts to ask, You all right? But Roger resumes. I was just a year old when I met the captain. In the intervening six months I had often visited the spot where little Bill had met his end, and I had sometimes been aware of a large black cat watching me there. I assumed that one day this cat would expect me to fight, but although we met each other in the conventional way, backs arched, tails erect, teeth bared, circling with our claws digging into the dust, he disarmed me by saying, "'You miss him, don't you? "'Your little brother. "'It was a senseless way to go.' "'And then he walked off, and I followed him, it was the turning point of my life. I expect I'm being thick, Wiggy says. But when this other cat, this captain, spoke to you, was it some sort of cat language? Of course it was cat language. I just told you I was only a year old. He led me into an old warehouse, all the way silent. Here we are, he said when we were finally inside. He spoke in a weary way. I didn't know then how old he was. I didn't know how many times he had gone through this process before. You're wondering why I picked you out, he said. Let's just say I had a hunch about you. I looked round. From the darkness, I was sure I could hear the far-off groaning of an injured cat. Is there someone else here? I said. I hoped I didn't give away how anxious I was. Yes, he said. I'll explain to you later, if there is a later. What do you mean? He sat down in front of me, his huge yellow eyes looking right into mine. Being captured by his gaze filled me with a strange mixture of terror and blissful joy. He leaned forward and said, very quietly, Has anyone ever talked to you about cats having nine lives? And then before I could say anything, he lashed at me with massive ferocity, slashing my throat. My blood gushed out, fell like heavy rain to the ground. I stumbled and fell, weakly, feeling the pulse of my heart, pumping my tiny young life out of me as I lay there, helpless. I remember that I felt surprise, but no resentment, no anger, and I succumbed to death. When I woke, I was desperately thirsty and my eyes hurt. The captain was watching me as if he had never moved. How long had I been dead? He pushed a water bowl towards me, and I drank every drop from it. He didn't speak, and I was too frightened to break the silence. He had just killed me, hadn't he? I had felt myself die, and yet I trusted him. After all, here I was. Alive, my throat appeared to have healed itself. The blood on the floor had dried. Whatever had happened, somehow the captain had it under his control. For the following few days, he brought me food, and I got stronger. And then, on the seventh day, he led me to another part of the building. We made our way into the darkness, in the direction of the groaning I had heard when we first came in. He stopped on the edge of a pit about fifteen feet deep. 
It was too dark to see the bottom, but I could detect movement down there and smell an overpowering stench of animal decay. I could hear cracked and labored breathing and the unmistakable squeak of rats, a sound that drives any cat crazy with loathing and bloodlust. You'll understand soon, he said, and knocked me in. I was down there for six whole days before I expired. My death was caused by a combination of dehydration, asphyxiation, and rat-induced dementia. It was the worst of all the deaths. It's no wonder that the captain always placed the pit second in the sequence. As he explained to me in the fullness of time, very few cats rose out of the pit and made it to their third life, let alone made it eventually, as I did so amazingly, to their ninth. Roger stops. You look confused, Wiggy, he says. Nine lives, then. It is quite a big idea to take in, I suppose, says Roger. Every cat has nine lives. Why do humans say that? Where did you get such a bizarre idea? Why do you pass it on? Every cat literally has the capacity within him to survive eight deaths. Up until, say, two thousand years ago, all cats had powers unimaginable to the average cat today. The species has been vastly diminished by time and domestication. In the modern world, only one cat in a million has the character, the spirit, the sheer, indomitable life force to fulfill that universal feline destiny of nine lives as part of a conscious program of self-completion. I am that one in a million. My initiation through the captain was long and merciless, a symphony of pain and despair, but there was no other way of finding out whether I was the one. After cutting my throat and then leaving me to die in the pit, he went on to hang me, drown me, brain me, there is a little whimper from Wiggy here, and gas me, burn me, and poison me, each time having to prepare himself for an even greater likelihood that I would not return." When I recovered from the final test, I found him bent over me, weeping. He thought I hadn't made it. He thought you were dead? Exactly. In the process of finding a companion for himself, the captain had sacrificed literally hundreds of cats over the course of forty years. All this killing had made the captain sad and weary and disgusted, he said, but it was the sense of perpetual letdown that had injured his spirit the most. Can you imagine it, Roger? He explained, losing all compassion, feeling only fury and dismay. I felt that I could, but I said carefully, I don't know. Think of little Bill, he said. I know you loved him, but be honest. Having survived eight deaths that were each of them far worse than his, what do you really think of him now? I thought of Bill, who had been so sweet and beloved, of my sense of loss, and then I said with perfect candor, you're right, little Bill, what a pussy! There is a pause, and then Roger laughs. It is a shriek of a laugh that raises all the hairs on the back of my neck each time I play it. Your face, he says. And then he laughs and laughs, and then, abruptly, the recording comes to an end. JPEG DSC 00021 This picture, in black and white, shows a man standing in a patch of bluebells in dappled light. His handsome face, big ears, holds a lit cigarette. Beside his leg sits a cat, the same cat as in the first picture, the one I assume is Roger. Roger is pressing his head against the man's calf, 
in what looks like an affectionate way. I wonder if the man is Michael, the one who died in Lincolnshire and bequeathed Roger to Wiggy's sister, Joe. No, it can't be. It's from much longer ago. The man's trousers are post-war. He looks a bit familiar. The quality of the picture is fuzzy, as if it had been printed on soft paper. JPEG DSC 00768. Again, black and white. Again, the picture quality suggests a fairly ancient date, 1960s. Two cats together, one is the supposed Roger cat, the other a massive black tom with a handsome head. The black cat is lying down, stretched out on a patch of long grass in sunshine. The Roger cat lies on his back, his legs in the air, his head resting on the black cat's abdomen. They're both relaxed. If they were young men instead of cats, you would assume they had been for a drink and a swim after their final examinations, and that there was an ancient teddy bear called Aloysius lying half-hidden in the grass. Behind them, little is in focus. A tree is casting shade across the bottom left-hand corner of the picture. Still, you can make out bushes. And an Elizabethan chimney. I looked at this photo several times before noticing, right in the foreground, at the top of the picture, a hazy horizontal shape. It makes no sense being presumably some distance off the ground, and too close to make out properly. Narrow my eyes, searching for detail. <laughs> it looks like a pair of brogues, heels together, toes pointed out. Roger Notes by Wiggy Roger's been tearing stories out of the papers. Of course, he's giving me the silent treatment still. What sort of cat is he? He never dealt with that scratching noise, did he? In the end, it just stopped. Anyway, the big silent act meant it was pointless asking him what these stories were that he was so bloody interested in. He's done it again every day since as well, as if he's looking for something in particular. So... Today, I secretly bought two copies of the paper and hid the second in the fridge, which might sound a bit odd, so I should explain that Roger, for all his mental brilliance, hasn't been able to work out a way to open the fridge. I put Joe's phone in there, still in the bag, after I realised Roger had been playing with it in the garden. I really must take that phone to a phone shop soon and see what can be done. Anyway, I left the first telegraph on the table, came back, to find it in the usual tatters, and quickly took both papers into the downstairs loo. In the end, it turned out he had torn out three stories, which were, one, a light-hearted news item about the statistics concerning various bizarre fatal domestic accidents last year in the UK, caused by teapots, dressing gowns, placemats, trousers. Two, a story about an East End gangster who had apparently taken his own life by jumping off the roof of a car park near the 2012 Olympic Stadium. Three, the obituary of some obscure academic from Cambridge. No idea what to make of any of this, and I can't even ask at the moment. Meow, 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 meow. He really is a bastard, Roger. When he's not talking, I feel I'm making no progress and might as well be dead. I don't know what to do with myself. I did have a look through Joe's binoculars yesterday and saw hardly any birds at all, so what a waste of time. Puzzling, though. Whatever Joe was watching for, she saw it virtually every day. In fact, this is quite interesting. On the day she called me, she made a note of seeing it at about 3.30 in the afternoon, which would be just before she called me at the theatre. Also, thinking about it, wouldn't it have been almost dark by then? Well, that means it can't be birds. That policeman came back today and asked whether I'd had the mobile looked at yet. I think he was quite surprised when I got it out of the fridge to give it to him, but he didn't say. Audio 2 
Wiggy and Roger are in a borrowed flat near to Russell Square in London. It's a winter afternoon. Roger has persuaded Wiggy to take him on a trip down memory lane, and they have gone together to London. Had it changed a lot? Wiggy asks. I could tell you were shocked when it turned out they'd built the Olympic velodrome directly on the site of the captain's special place. Roger doesn't speak. Do you miss the captain? Roger laughs. No, he says. He laughs again. Anyone else but Wiggy would realise that this is an intriguing answer and would follow it up. Wiggy, frustratingly, does not. Why did we have to see that car park? Just a theory. Wiggy thinks for a moment. He is evidently making a connection to the car park suicide from the papers. Don't mention the cuttings from the newspaper, Wiggy. Knowing the contents of those three stories torn out by Roger from the telegraph is your single advantage right now. You will be pleased to hear that for once he makes an intelligent decision. Will you live forever, Roger? he asks. That was what I asked the captain. Immortality is always discovered to be far more of a burden than a blessing. Of course, I didn't think like this in those far-off days of my youth, but I knew enough to be afraid of what the captain had done to me. After all, as a nine-lifer himself, he was clearly not a happy cat. He did not rejoice in his own immortality, if that was what he had. It was clear that the only thing that gave him happiness was me. For the next ten years, in fact, we travelled, it was easy enough to get to the docks at Tilbury to hop aboard a ship and leave London far behind. On that first ship, we were cornered in the engine room by four big, heavy cats. The captain looked at the biggest of the four. The cat looked back, and then something phenomenal happened. They retreated, and we never saw them again because, as I later realized... They threw themselves overboard. It was the grandest of grand tours. We saw art, we saw architecture, we read books and learned languages. My best memory is of lying on a rocking wooden deck on a starlit night in the Aegean, with the captain reciting Tennyson's Ulysses faultlessly beside me. Roger is evidently so moved by the recollection that for a moment he almost turns conversational. It was Greece that captured my heart. Have you read the Durrells? Um, we knew them in Corfu. Well, they didn't know us because we kept ourselves to ourselves, but we lived very happily for a while in all three of their villas. We borrowed Larry's books. We read some of his manuscripts. We even helped ourselves to some of Gerald's smaller zoological specimens. In the end, the captain and I spent three whole years in the Greek islands, and it was the very best of times. I was so very happy on the Isle of Simi that I hoped we would settle there forever. But it was on Simi that the captain started to reveal an unfortunate trait— a kind of psychotic possessiveness, which in the end made me anxious to move on and meant we were never safe for long in any one place. At see me, you see, something rather horrible occurred, the first of a series of horrible things. A kindly waiter at a harbourside taverna would sometimes tickle me under the chin and fling me a piece of octopus. I thought it was nice of him, and I played up to it, scoffing the titbit and meowing for more. His name was Galandis, and I stupidly mentioned him to the captain. I even made the excited suggestion that we might want to settle down at Galandis's taverna and be looked after for a while. The captain pretended to be interested in my suggestion. He made me point out Galandis when we were sitting on the harbour wall one evening— Two days later, 
I arrived at the taverna, and there was no Galandis. His wife was sobbing, people were shouting, and the church bells were tolling. The focus of attention was a black hand-cart, dripping seawater onto the ground. Galandis had drowned himself. The captain joined me on the wall. "'What a shame,' he said. "'That was your nice human friend, wasn't it? "'They're saying he jumped into the sea from his little fishing boat last night, "'and he had rocks in his pockets. Three more blameless Greek people on three different islands "'had to set the church bells tolling before it dawned on me "'that it wasn't a coincidence. "'I thought for a while that I somehow infected these people with despair.' But it must have been the captain. He was possessive. He was a classic psychopath, obviously, and he had nothing but contempt for the average human. However, I never had evidence that he tampered with any of them. But you must be wondering why I wanted to visit Bloomsbury. It began with a boy. Roger sounds different, suddenly. Less carefree, less in control. He was an English boy in glasses and long shorts, he says. And I spotted him at the Acropolis one day when I was on my own there. He was sitting on a piece of fallen masonry in the midday sun, making an elaborate drawing of the Parthenon, working so hard on it that I was sure he was oblivious to everything else, certainly to me. Why were you on your own? Where was the captain? On a bus to Piraeus, he'd gone to check the ferry times. We were leaving Athens the next day for Brindisi. The last words he said to me were... He stops. This is clearly emotional for him. Sorry, he says. Roger, if this is difficult for you, I'm all right. This boy... I was really drawn to him, you see. With his glasses and sketchbook and grey socks, he reminded me of one of those nice intellectual durrells on Corfu. I felt sorry for him because he was sitting in full sun without a hat. As it happened, the captain and I had recently spotted an old Panama hat left in the dust, and in my concern for him, I didn't hesitate. I went and got it and dragged it over. It was possibly the nicest thing I've ever done for someone else. Well, how true it is that no good deed goes unpunished. The boy smiled, thanked me, and took the hat. Then he poured some cool water from a flask into a little bowl and gave it to me. I lapped it up, and he stroked my head. You're not a Greek cat, are you? he said. I purred a bit uncertainly, and then he uttered the fateful words. Aha, he said, I thought so. I'm positive I didn't speak to him, yet somehow I did betray myself to that boy. Something I did gave me away, and then, oh, it was vile, he picked me up by the scruff of my neck and said, I've read about cats like you. Then he produced some string from his pocket, and before I could do anything, he'd put a running slipknot around my neck and was pulling me away. That same afternoon, I was taken with a heap of other luggage to the port and put on a ship for England. When we arrived back in England, we came straight to London, and I escaped and came straight to Bloomsbury. How did you manage it, the escape? Oldest trick in the book, I'm afraid. Laundry basket. And why Bloomsbury? I suppose I only had one idea. Where would the captain think to look for me? I'd worked it out on the voyage. He'd last seen me at the Parthenon, so the obvious place was the London home of the Parthenon marbles. The British Museum was my actual home both during the war and for a long time after. Even when all the objects were evacuated... I stayed put. I still visit as often as I can. The boy became an academic. I followed his progress. 
he specialized in pre-Christian attitudes to animals, in particular their relationship to the afterlife as companions and so on. In the fullness of time, he grew old. But what he did when he abducted me from Greece was ultimately to draw to him the wrath of the captain. He lives still, but it's a miracle. And I have reason to believe that he doesn't have long. More Stuff by Wiggy Sergeant Duggan brought the phone back with pretty extraordinary news. It had been urinated on by a cat while it was charging. Whoa! The effect was basically to electrocute the insides of the phone. Duggan said he'd never heard of anything like it. Roger happened to saunter into the kitchen as if by coincidence. Um, did they retrieve anything from the sim thing? I asked. I had no idea what a sim thing was. Oh, no, he said. Because it's an iPhone, there's nothing stored on the SIM card apart from account data. Roger curled up on a nearby chair, as if unconcerned. All the interesting and useful stuff would have been stored on the phone itself, which, as we know, was destroyed, burnt out. I looked at Roger. He was doing a bit of grooming, but with his ears pricked up for every word. What a cool customer! However, he wasn't prepared for what the bloke revealed next. But fortunately, all is not lost, he announced, and God, it was funny to see Roger's reaction. He fell off the chair. Most people sync their phones with their computers, and if your sister did that, we can sync this replacement phone, he held one up, and find out what was on her other phone the last time she plugged it in, do you see? Can we do it now? I asked. That thinking thing? Of course, he said. Shall I? I said, absolutely, and he was just going upstairs when his own phone beeped with a text message. He stopped to read it. Roger hopped up on the table. He was pretending he didn't understand a word anyone was saying. Any news, I said, when the policeman had finished reading his text. Silly, really, he said. We thought we'd just check whether this cat peeing on a charging phone thing had ever been recorded before, as part of, you know, suspicious circumstances. It turns out it has. Roger pulled away, jumped off the table and strolled to the cat flap, but waited to hear the end of the conversation before going outside. So you mean it has happened before? About six months ago, apparently, in Lincolnshire, at the home of some sort of artist who fell downstairs. An hour later, we had flicked through nearly all the contents of Joe's phone, and let's just say we had different ideas about what we'd found. He thought we'd found nothing. A series of pictures of the garden taken from the upstairs window, with a large, unknown black cat in them, sometimes with that loyal dog Jeremy face to face with him, were of no interest whatsoever. And then we looked properly at the last picture taken with the phone, a picture of Jeremy, Joe's beloved Border Terrier. At first glance, it had looked like a simple snap of Jeremy lying on his side on the gravel by the gate. But oh no, this was not a doggy having a lie down in the sun on some nice winter's day. This was taken on the day Joe disappeared, the day she called me in the theatre, the day something really bad happened at this house. Poor little J-Dog was lying right beside the big five-bar gate that leads to the lane, and his face, well, his whole head, really, was crushed. The poor little thing was obviously dead. The policeman and I went straight out to the gate, and when we got there, there were still traces of blood and dog hair in the hinge of the gate, about a foot off the ground, exactly Jeremy's height. I noticed Roger watching us from the garden wall as we examined the scene. It was easy enough to see what had happened. In the gravel we even found some little doggy teeth. So, the dog was sniffing here, said the policeman, and then someone lifted the latch 
Is it a heavy gate? I could hardly speak. I just nodded. The thing is, it's a very heavy gate, yes. And the way it swings open, Joe always said it was lethal. That's why we tended to leave it open. It had been open ever since I arrived. So the poor dog must have been standing there with his little nose right in the hinge of the gate when someone lifted the latch. But why had he been standing there? Look at this, said the policeman, bending down. He was deliberately lured. And there it was. A bone, now stripped of all flesh, was wedged between the gatepost and the wall. At this point, I'm sorry, I was sick. She wouldn't have done this herself, he said. Oh, God, no! I felt like crying. Up on the wall, Roger was still watching, not moving. The policeman made to leave. I'll find out if she took the dog's body to a vet's anywhere. This could explain why she left in such a hurry, he said, although it doesn't explain why she didn't take the car. He turned and gave me a searching look. It's a shame you didn't notice it before, he said, and it's even more of a shame that you didn't do anything useful with that phone. It was the first hint of unfriendliness in his tone. I'm sorry, Mr. Kayton points, I have to say this. You haven't done anything to find out what happened to your sister, have you? I'm beginning to think that you're not telling me everything. Interpolation with apologies. Yesterday, I left the cottage for the first time and drove to Norwich. I imagined I would go shopping for food, possibly catch an improving matinee, and spend a few moments at an internet cafe checking on Wiggy's appearance schedule at the theatre in Coventry. In fact, I spent four hours at the internet cafe and was so upset I had to come back at once. The bare facts of what I discovered are these. 1. Will Caton Pines, Wiggy to his friends, did appear in See How They Run. The play was on at the Belgrade just two months ago. 2. He is now at the centre of a gruesome investigation into the death of his sister. The noted watercolourist, Joanna Caton Pines, who had been missing for three weeks from her cottage near Littlehampton, was found in the first week of December in the cellar of an adjoining house with the corpse of a dog whose head had apparently been crushed. Both she and the dog had been partly devoured by rats. She was alive when she entered the cellar, but the dog was not. She died, says the preliminary report, of dehydration, asphyxiation and, possibly, rat-induced dementia. Her brother is the chief suspect, mainly because much of his behaviour is inexplicable. He withheld from the police the fact that he had heard scratching from beyond the party wall for several days after his sister went missing. Those scratchings were, of course, the sound of his sister clawing at the bottom of a heavy trap-door to a cellar, after he eventually found his sister's body, it is clear that he did not contact the police for at least three hours. In the interim, he evidently went on a bloody rampage, in which he bludgeoned a cat to death, beheaded it, and incinerated its body in the garden. 3. The academic whose obituary Roger had removed from the Daily Telegraph was a Professor Peplow. He was 82 and he appeared to have killed himself using hemlock. In the 1960s, he had co-authored a major work on the place of animals in ancient death cults with a Dr. G. L. Winterton. Neighbours reported his agitation about repeatedly spotting a large black cat in the area. He left a note saying, I have lost the will to live. It was to a sad and comfortless house that I returned after cutting short my wintry sojourn by the sea. But the dog seemed glad to be home. He scratched at the garden gate and panted excitedly. This I found rather gratifying, until it dawned on me. Was he expecting to see Mary? It was soon distressingly clear that such was indeed the case. 
Once inside, I'm afraid I grew quite impatient with him as he stupidly ran round and round, romping upstairs and down, barking and wagging his tail, pawing at closed doors. It was only when he had searched the entire house three or four times that he was prepared to admit defeat. He crawled under a chair and glared at me with an accusing expression that was all the more tragic, because in happier times Mary and I had often imitated it for each other's amusement. Oh, bear, she would say to me. We had pet names for each other, I'm afraid. Bear, how could you? And then she would pull the accusing doggy face, and we would both laugh. No wonder I couldn't bring myself to look at him right now. It was Mary who had the idea of naming him Watson. At first she'd liked the thought of saying to an enthusiastic puppy, Come, Watson, come, the game's afoot. But it turned out to be a rather clever inspiration, and the name stuck. In parks and woods, when Watson was off the lead, Mary would call, Come at once, if convenient, Watson. If inconvenient, come all the same. I went to the gloomy study, switched on my computer, and started to download 216 emails. I had, as yet, made no decision about Wiggy and Roger, but my instinct was strong. Forget it. On the drive home, all the way, I had maintained a running internal dialogue. Was Dr. Winterton in desperate danger? No, stop thinking about this. A bit tough that poor Peplow had to die, although I have to say it was very classy of him to have chosen Hemlock. Why had Joe put her phone on to charge and then gone next door to hide in the cellar? Why hadn't she taken it with her? You're right. This is a detail that makes no sense. Why did she think a next-door cellar was a good place to hide anyway? Imagine the sight Wiggy found when he opened that trap door. No, don't. Don't ever try to imagine that. You realise he heard the scratching for several days. If he hadn't been such an idiot, he might have saved her. Don't say that. All of this story, remember, is based on the premise of an evil talking cat called Roger that travelled romantically in the footsteps of Lord Byron in the 1930s. At six o'clock the doorbell rang. It was one of the neighbours, Tony something. I suppose I really should know his surname by now, but I'm afraid I left that kind of thing to Mary. Alec, Tony said. I noticed the lights were on. I realise I haven't mentioned my name before, I do apologise. I suppose it was because this wasn't my story. Everything all right? Tony asked. He and his wife Eleanor have been very solicitous since Mary died. How's the coast? A trifle bleak, I said. I was just checking. You're back a little earlier than you said. Yes, I'd had enough. Someone was looking for you, he said. Really? I tried not to smile, but I felt Excited. A mysterious visitor? What if it was Winterton? Was he quite old? I said. Tony laughed. Incredibly old. I laughed as well. A bit dusty? Incredibly dusty. Dishevelled? Incredibly dishevelled, yes. He seemed relieved that I knew who he was talking about. He said he was a friend of Mary's. That's it, I said. "'Apparently she worked with him on some project at the library.' "'Exactly,' I said. "'Some project at the library.' "'He went back down the path, and I shut the door and laughed. "'Watson looked up at me with a quizzical air and wagged his tail, "'but I could hardly explain to him why I was so happy that the game was afoot. "'I didn't remotely understand it myself. "'Surely I didn't want to know more.' about the evil Roger. Three days were to pass before Dr. Winterton called on me. In the interim, I tried to adopt a normal domestic routine, but being at home brought me closer than ever to my sense of loss. In the evenings, I tried to watch television, but quickly gave up. 
everything touched me too deeply. Everything mercilessly underlined the same theme. It was all death, and all entirely unsupportable. The only recourse was to watch quizzes, but, sadly, those were impossible too. Mary and I had watched University Challenge together. She was hilariously bad at identifying great composers from even their most famous compositions. Haydn, she would say to anything musical. In the end, while I waited for Winterton, I decided to visit my old colleagues at the library. Mary's dreamy colleague Tawny happened to come along. I had always felt sorry for her on account of her owlish name, presumably the proud handiwork of irresponsible hippie parents. Halleck! Tawny had a sing-song sort of voice and wide eyes. She was about forty-five years old. It used to drive Mary absolutely insane to work with her. Oh, I'm glad you're back, she pointed a finger at me. I was going to call you. Have you got time to come and see? See what? What I was going to call you about, she said. I had promised myself not to risk going into the great reading room on this first experimental return to the library. But now here we were, suddenly, in Mary's old domain, through the heavy swing doors and into that perfect, hermetically sealed world of panelling and high windows and book dust and polish and B.O. and soft, continuous keyboard clatter. Down each side of the room were the individual, lockable carols that Mary could, at her discretion, allocate to research students and academics. But they often stood empty. Mary had told me that once in a while she would take a key to an unused carol and lock herself inside for a couple of hours just to get a break from Tawny, was what she used to say. It was to one of the carols that Tawny now led me. She held the key. Now, this is really strange, she said in a whisper. We think it must have happened the weekend before Mary... She stopped. She couldn't say it, so I had to say it for her. The weekend before Mary died, I said helpfully. Yes. We had stopped outside Carol number 17, which I now faintly remembered was the little private space that Mary had joked about retreating to. Tawny turned the key. The thing is, Tawny said very quietly, the caretaker said he'd seen a cat prowling about in the library, and he tried to catch him, but of course he never expected this. A cat, shh, she said. I had forgotten to whisper. We don't know how he got in, but he's on the CCTV. He's huge. Anyway, there's a bit of a smell, so you'd better... Tawny opened the door. Oh, my God, I said. I stumbled back. Alec, quick, oh, sit down. I'm so sorry. Wait here. I'll get someone. No, stay, I said. I held onto the door jam and tried to make sense of the scene inside the carol, holding my hand over my face. The best way I can describe it is this. Imagine you had placed a small, orderly, panelled room in a jungle clearing and come back a week later when all the larger wild beasts had taken turns frenziedly tearing it to pieces, slaughtering inside it and treating it as a lavatory. The walls were slashed and splintered, papers were torn and scattered, books looked as if they had exploded, blood was spattered in flying arcs. The smell, of course, was cat urine. How big was this cat? There were claw marks on the walls a good six inches across. And to think that all this violence had been done, in a way, to Mary. It's this bit that freaks me most, Tawny said. She pointed to the drawer in the desk, which must have been locked when the cat got in. The area around the drawer was cut and slashed so badly that splinters and chips had flown off. Grimacing, Tawny pointed to where, embedded in the shattered wood, there was a large claw 
its end coated in dried blood. It had evidently been dug so deeply into the desk that the cat had not been able to withdraw it. I know I'm being stupid, she whispered, but it's as if it wanted to get into the drawer. What's in there? I said. Nothing. It's empty, she said, and drew it out to show me. Tony decided I had seen enough. She shut the door again and we moved to the corner of the reading room where we could speak a little more loudly. One thing above all I needed to know. Did Mary know about this? I said. Tawny, did she see this? We think she did, said Tawny. Actually, I'm sure she did. It was on the Monday morning, you see. Do you remember I called you and said she'd gone home not feeling well? Of course I remembered. Mary had died later that day. This must have happened over a weekend, you see, and I remember she took the key on the Monday morning and came down here. I'm sure she came straight back to the inquiry's desk and said she didn't feel well. She had something with her, a small slim book, I think, in one of those old university slip cases. She went up the spiral staircase behind the desk. She was gone for a while, and then she came back down and went home and, oh, Alec, I never saw her again. A tear rolled down her face. She took away the key with her, which she shouldn't have done. But that's why we didn't find out what had happened in there until a few days ago, when we came up with a duplicate. We'd noticed the smell, of course, but we didn't realise it was coming from here. Some of the readers, well, you know what they're like. Did you see what it did? To the books. I was still reeling. There was no doubt that this carol had been Mary's. In the debris I had recognised her handwriting on some of the ravaged papers. But why hadn't she told me what she was doing in there? Why had she lied to me? Had Dr. Winterton really been working on a project with Mary? What had she got herself into? And what, by extension, and she got me into, too. This destructive act had been done, without question, by a large and powerful cat. Oh, God! Until this moment, it had been of no real concern to me whether the captain existed or not, but now, disbelief was not an option. Can you open it again, Tawny? I said. I have to know what she was working on in there. Tawny pulled a face. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. But technically I'm not supposed to show it to anyone. I just felt you should know. This was very frustrating. All right. Where are the books from, at least, I said. Do you know? Oh, yes. They're from the Seaward Collection. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. Of course, I said. Of course they're from the Seaward. The Seaward was a world-famous collection donated to the library on the collector's death in the 1960s and classified as Arcana. Since that time, it had been housed deep in the library stacks. John Seward had been a celebrated journalist come ghost hunter in interwar Britain, the sort of chap who made friends with, instead of running a mile from, self-styled diabolists such as Alastair Crowley. He had collected books on ancient mysteries, also ghosts, witches, satanic rites, and so on. Tawny tried to comfort me. In the end, it's only books and papers that were damaged, Alec. No one was hurt, I'm sure. I think the cat must have just got locked in and gone berserk. I had to think quickly. Is Julian in today? Julian Prido was the keeper of the special collections, and was very rarely seen. Mary and I had jointly decided he was the laziest librarian on the planet. Tawny would know as well as I did that if it was a month with any letters in it whatsoever, the answer was probably no. I don't know, but I shouldn't think so, said Tawny, choosing her words carefully. But look, Julian doesn't know about what's happened in there. Only a very few people have seen inside. 
She turned the big eyes to mine and seemed concerned. Alec, I think we should get you a glass of water and then you should go home. I allowed Tawny to lead me to the staff room where I drank some water and left her there. I gave her the impression that I would be heading home immediately. In this matter, I misled her quite deliberately. By the time I did leave the building, an hour later, my mind was spinning. I knew that Julian's office was never locked, that it was accessible from staircase B, and that even if Julian was the laziest librarian in the world, my dear wife Mary was the most conscientious. If she had borrowed books from the Seaward collection, she would have left a record. Within a couple of minutes of larcenous trespassing, I had obtained a list of the books she had borrowed. The loans had been carefully handwritten by Mary in Julian's ancient logbook, presumably in his absence. I quickly made notes of them all. What captured my interest was the last item Mary had borrowed. It was a rare item, a leaflet written by John Seward himself, privately printed in a small edition in 1960. My heart sank when I saw the title. Nine Lives, The Gift of Satan. Checking with the online catalogue for more details, I discovered that Nine Lives wasn't listed. Fortunately, I knew that with a donated collection such as the Seaward, the card catalogue of the original classifier would have been preserved. It didn't take long to discover that the Seaward card catalogue was, in fact, one of several dusty cases stacked behind Julian's desk. It had not been very respectfully preserved. In the back of one of the card drawers there were stuffed some random bits and pieces. I saw a bit of old leather with a buckle on it. Carefully, I riffled through the cards to find the right one. I then removed it from the drawer and took it to the photocopier on the fourth floor where, fortunately, I saw no one I knew. I then quickly returned to Julian's office and replaced it in the drawer, but not before its unusual classification had caught my eye. It was one I had heard about but never seen before. The great Public library in Boston, Massachusetts, employed it in the 19th century. Stamped in red ink, on the corner of the Nine Lives, the Gift of Satan card, was just one word in capitals. Inferno. Its meaning, simply, was that it should be burned. Winterton arrived at dusk on the day I had been to the library. Contrary to all expectations, it was a jolly evening. There was just one problem. I had expected Winterton to explain everything to me, and he didn't. Getting a straight reply from him on any matter at all turned out to be frustratingly difficult. Unlike Roger the Cat, with his beautifully lucid and rigidly linear narratives, Winterton started everything in the middle. How did Mary get involved in your work, I said, when we first sat down to our supper. Mary said she'd found something for me in the sea ward, Alec. I need it. The captain is closing in, you see. He got Peplo. I huffed. Can we come back to that, I said. Please, for now, can you just please tell me how it all started with Mary? He looked at the ceiling. I think he was genuinely trying to focus on the question he'd been asked. Instead, he dropped a bit of a bombshell. Roger helped me put the folder together for you. We felt we owed you that. This was such a large piece of new information that I had to pursue it. I thought Roger was dead, I said. Didn't Wiggy cut his head off? Winterton looked surprised. No, Roger's in fine form. But Wiggy attacked a cat and did unspeakable things. Oh, that! Sorry, he laughed. <laughs> Neighbor's cat. I don't understand. There was this black cat hanging around the house, you see. But the black cat was the captain. Oh, no, 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 Winterton laughed. That wasn't the captain. 
The cat Joe had photographed on her phone wasn't the captain. Joe might have thought it was the captain, but it was just some neighborhood black cat. Looking back, I should have asked him then and there about Joe. Did he know why she had hidden next door? How had she become trapped? Why hadn't Roger told Wiggy where she was? But he still hadn't answered my original question. How did Mary get involved? I asked again, steadily. They banned me from the library ten years ago, you see, he said. Oh, good grief, I said. I needed to stop asking open-ended questions. Did you meet Roger on the Acropolis? I said. Oh, he was a bit surprised by the sudden change of direction, but he answered me simply, which was a relief. Yes, yes, I did. He thought about it some more and then added, Yes, I was very young. Is his story about his nine lives true? Oh, I think so, yes. Are you in cahoots with Roger? Cahoots? Oh, um, yes, I suppose so, yes. Does he do your bidding? Quite the opposite. I'm his creature, oh, yes. Does the captain exist? Oh, I'm afraid so. Sometimes he kills, sometimes people kill themselves. Oh, yes, powers. Is Roger telling the truth about their relationship in the files? I don't know. What does he say? I was rather shocked that Winterton didn't know the full contents of the folder he had sent me. Mainly that the captain is jealous of Roger's closeness to humans, so he always arranges in some supernatural way for them to lose the will to live. Uh, what was the question again? Is that the relationship between Roger and the captain? No. Well, perhaps it used to be, but... Roger hasn't seen the captain for years and years, you see. Does he look up to the captain? What? No, not any more. So? He hates him. Basically, he wants someone to help kill him, you see. He was working on Wiggy, telling him the first part of the story, building up to the big stuff when he and the captain were reunited after the war. But then it all turned nasty when Wiggy found out about Joe. So he'll have to start again now he thought for a moment. To be honest, he has already started again. On you. That's why he wanted me to send the file. It's all coming to a head, you see. I didn't like the sound of that. Can the captain even be killed? Ah, there's the rub. He gave me a significant look. Look, I said, this is what I really want to know. Were you responsible in any way for Mary's death? Did the captain come here? He sucked his teeth and pulled a face. I waited. And then he answered quietly, Yes, I think he did. I put my head in my hands. I'm so sorry I got Mary involved, he went on. Roger thought she was the perfect ally because she thought his story was all nonsense. We were getting very close to something, you see. If you help us now... I had so many other questions, but for the time being I could manage only one more. Have you ever heard of a publication entitled Nine Lives, The Gift of Satan? I said. The effect on Winterton was electric. He jumped up and set Watson off barking. No, how do you know about that? Have you got it? Is it here? Winterton left at around 10.30. Watson and I escorted him to the main road where we saw him into a taxi. We shook hands before he got into the cab and quickly ran over the highlights of the plan we had made. Saturday at six, I said. Back entrance near the cycle parking area. You have to be in position because I'll only have a few seconds. When Mary had come home from the library on that Monday morning, she had known she was in danger. Working with the shambolic Geoffrey Winterton had attracted the attention of an evil cat looking for a book written by a famous diabolist on the subject, presumably, of supernatural longevity in cats. What had she done? Being Mary, she had acted. I now believed that she had retrieved the Seaward pamphlet 
from the devastated Carol and hidden it elsewhere in the library. My wife was enough of a Sherlock Holmes fan to know that a library was the very best place in which to secrete a book. Behind the inquiry's desk in the reading room, she had ascended the small staff-only spiral staircase to the stacks above. From this, I knew one thing for certain. She had not returned the book to the Seaward collection. I looked up Seaward on the internet. It turned out that Seaward could be googled in umpteen ways. John Seaward Diabolist, John Seaward Suicide, John Seaward Cat Master. Having investigated a famous haunted manor house in Dorset in the early 1930s for a newspaper feature, he had gone on to buy the property and convert it into a satanic weekend retreat for seances, devil worship, pagan rites, licentious blood coughing and so on. Harville Manor became a byword for depraved goings-on, and after he moved in permanently after the war, he hardly ever left the grounds until the day in September 1964 when his lifeless body was found hanging from a tree in the garden. Miraculously, there were photographs. There were press shots of Seaward with some of his celebrity house guests. But the most notable thing was the cats. Seaward kept scores of them. In every picture, there would be half a dozen or more. In the end, I decided to make a file of these cat pictures and started dragging them off the websites. And then I spotted him, the captain. I knew him at once. In several pictures, Seaward was holding the captain in his arms, which can't have been easy given his size. Ahoy there, captain, began one of the extended captions, but I hardly needed the confirmation by now. Something struck me. I opened the old Roger file. That Elizabethan chimney I had spotted in one of the old photographs. Was the picture taken at Seaward's house? Not remembering which JPEG was which, I opened both of the old black and white photographs, the first of Roger with an unknown man among the bluebells, the second of Roger and the captain lazing in the long grass with the mysterious blur high in the foreground. I whistled. There was no doubt about it. The man was John Seward. And to judge by the dating of the other pictures I'd been looking at, this had been taken in the 1940s. The other picture was taken in the garden at Harville. Studying it now, I noticed for the first time a date scratched in the corner of the negative. 3rd of September, 1964. It sounded familiar, and for good reason. This was the day that John Seward hanged himself, leaving no note. The significance of this picture was revealed at last. This was the place he had done it. The image in the blurry foreground was of Seward's feet, the brogue shoes of a man dangling from a tree on a beautiful late summer's day in his own historic garden. Watson was woofing and scratching at the study door, wanting to get out. I ignored him. I was lost in this search. I found a news feature about Seward printed by a local paper after his death, in which various residents of the area attested to the goings-on at Harville Manor. A Mr. Corbett, aged 65, alleged that there were rituals at the big house in which cats were sacrificed and otherwise used in devil worship. His own cat, Tina, had once disappeared for three months, and he was sure she was at Harville all that time. When she came back, she would sit staring at him until he felt queasy. And she would also go into fits, foaming at the mouth and writhing and spitting whenever the church bells rang out or songs of praise came on the telly. For the last twelve years of his life, Seward never left the grounds of Harville. It was believed that he wrote the majority of his books in this period, books that he published privately and circulated secretly. I checked back on my notes. Nine Lives was published in 1960. I had to find it. More than that, I had to make sure it never got into the paws of the captain. But why should I be taking sides with Roger? 
Roger was an evil cat, who not only deliberately ignored the sound of a woman dying in a cellar, but also fiendishly urinated on people's mobile phones to destroy incriminating evidence. What should I do? And all this time, while I was trying to think, Watson was being incredibly tiresome, scratching at the study door and whining to be let out. All right, I said impatiently. I let him out, and he raced to the kitchen, barking. When I switched off the computer, I realized Watson wasn't barking any more. Watson, I called. Where are you? There was no response. The house was silent. I stood up and went to the hallway. Watson? Watson, where are you? A shiver of dread went through me. Watson! I stood still and listened. Watson! I tried to say it calmly. Alec, in the living room, don't turn the light on. It was a male voice with a clipped, authoritative, unflappable tone. We have to get out of here. I've got a plan. Pack enough chicken treats for a fortnight. What can I say? It was Watson. And he sounded just like Daniel Craig. From Alec Charlesworth, sent Thursday, 15th of January, 4.25 p.m., to William Caton Pines, subject Roger, attachments, beside the sea, folder, and home, file. Dear William Caton Pines, This is a very difficult email to write. The long and short of it is that I have heard what happened at Shingle Cottage, and much as I have resisted becoming involved in the story of the two individuals known as Roger and the Captain... I find that I am now in it absolutely up to my neck. I've had to leave my house. I've had to move into a and b near the station, but you don't even know who I am yet. Rather than explain everything here, I have attached a folder and a file for you to read, some of which you will be familiar with, as it was written by you in the first place. I think it will make clear everything that's happened so far. When you've read it all, you will know everything everything that I know, which means you will also be aware of many unanswered questions and many frustrating gaps. Before you read the attached, I feel I should apologise for any observations detrimental to yourself. I believe I call you an idiot on several regrettable occasions, and also remarks such as, he really is out of his intellectual depth with Roger, and uh, for once he makes an intelligent decision. The plain fact is that I did find myself quite captivated by Roger. I think it was something to do with his educated love of Tennyson's earlier poetry. Since my life is evidently in danger from talking cats with lethal powers, and since there is no one else in the world with whom I would dare even raise the subject of talking cats, could I persuade you to act as my archivist? I realize I don't know your current feelings on what happened at the cottage, but please believe that I am appalled and horrified by everything that happened there, and I intend that nothing like it shall ever happen again. If I could just feel that the record was being kept somewhere by you, it would help me face all that has yet to be done. In short, will you be my friend? Yours sincerely, Alec Charlesworth, F.C.I.L.I.P. Fellow of the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals. From Wiggy Caton Pines, sent Friday, 16th of January, 10.45 a.m. To Alec Charlesworth. Subject, blimey. Dear Alec Charlesworth, how the hell did you get my email address? Wiggy. From Alec, sent Friday, 16th of January, 11.30 a.m. To Wiggy. Subject, blimey. Dear Wiggy, I'm afraid a certain cat leaked it to Dr. Winterton. From Wiggy, sent Friday, 16th of January, 11.37am to Alec. Subject, blimey, jeez. Alec, 
I need to think about this. Bit of a shock, raking it all up again. Wiggy. X. From Alec. Sent Friday 16th of January, 11.40am. To Wiggy. Subject, blimey. If you would just read the files, Wiggy. Please. Alec. From Wiggy. Sent Friday 16th of January, 6.34pm. To Alec. Subject, all right. Sorry it took me a while. I've read them and I have a question. Can your dog really talk or did you make that up? From Alec, sent Friday 16th of January, 6.52pm, to Wiggy. Thank you very much for reading the files. In answer to your question, no, I didn't make anything up. Tomorrow night, Dr. Winterton and I will attempt to purloin the Seaward pamphlet after the library closes. I'm sure it contains the answer. Otherwise, why would the captain go to such lengths to recover or destroy it? By the way... You never answered my question about whether you're willing to act as repository for the rest of this story. Yours, Alec. From Alec. Sent Saturday, 17th of January, 4.30pm to Wiggy. Subject, Operation Seaward. Dear Wiggy, I'm just setting off for the library. If anything should happen to me, Watson will be at the Sandringham B&B in Milton Road, not far from Cambridge Station. I'm sorry if this is too much information, but it's... Very important for me to tell someone what's going on, Alec. From Alec, sent Saturday, 17th of January, 11.45pm, to Wiggy. Subject, Operation Seaward. Attachments, PDF, Plan of Library. Dear Wiggy, still not having heard from you, I'm afraid I've decided to use you as my confidant anyway. Winterton has been injured, Wiggy. Quite badly. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I should tell the story properly or not at all. This is for the record, isn't it? This evening, I entered the library at 5 p.m., using my temporary membership. As you will see from the attached plan of the library, the space immediately above the great reading room, accessible by the spiral staircase behind the desk, contains the music stacks, which are not accessible to readers anyway from anywhere else. I had worked out a rather good plan, I thought. The main thing was to distract the dreamy tawny away from the desk, then sneak up the spiral staircase to the music library, search for the book, and hide there until the library closed at 5.30. Then, using the spare set of master keys that Mary and Tawny have always left in the top drawer of the inquiry's desk, I would let myself out of the reading room and make my way down staircase A to the emergency exit next to the cycle racks, Opening the door would set off an alarm, but the idea was that I would quickly hand the book and the incriminating set of library keys to Winterton, who would be positioned outside. I would then go back inside and face the music with the security man, claiming to have fallen asleep on the floor of the history library before closing time, and apologising for causing so much trouble. Winterton and I would then rendezvous at the nearby Colquick just before it closed at 6.30 where we would copy and scan the pamphlet and I could send the scan straight to you for safekeeping. I am writing this in A and E. It is 9.45 and I am trying to keep a lid on things. Winterton was delirious by the time we got here. He'd lost so much blood. Pray God he doesn't spill the beans to anyone about exactly how and why he got those terrible cuts and gashes. The first bit of my plan worked quite well. Improvising, I used a cat's meow to draw Tawny's attention, and she left the desk to investigate. There are two sets of swing doors to the reading room at the same end, so it was quite easy to do the meow from one side and then nip round to the other doors and dodge up the spiral staircase while Tawny had gone the other way. There was no one else up there, thank goodness. But there was one obvious problem to be solved. I had no idea where Mary had shelved the book. Here were six long walkways of tall stacks, all packed with tall, thin musical scores. The Seaward pamphlet, in its protective slipcase, would hardly be conspicuous up here, and I had only twenty minutes to find it before all the lights shut off automatically at five-thirty. I thought about Mary. What would she have done? Where would she hide something in a music library? What did she know about music? Well, not very much. 
I thought of us watching University Challenge together, and Mary cluelessly shouting out the same answer every week, and that was enough. Haydn! She would have hidden it under Haydn. And so she had. I found the pamphlet tucked behind a score of The Surprise Symphony, just before the room was plunged into darkness. Tawny wasted no time at all in closing up. Only then did I start to creep carefully down the spiral staircase. In the great reading room, the high windows allowed a certain amount of grey light into the room, but it was a while before my eyes grew accustomed to the murk. I groped in the drawer for the keys and found them. But then I heard something, faint and muffled but unmistakable, that made my blood run cold, a human scream. I now believe that what I heard was Winterton. Wiggy, I'll have to break off here. They just told me they're going to keep him in. They've commanded me to go home. They've already given him a transfusion. He is now under sedation. He is definitely on the mend. I told them I was a mere acquaintance of his who happened to discover him in his assaulted state, but I also said I knew he had no relatives, so I felt I should wait to see how he was. It's nearly midnight. It's been a long day, and I'm glad to be leaving. I am desperate to get back to Watson. He is a resourceful little dog, but a little dog nonetheless. I'll write again as soon as I can. Alec. From Wiggy, sent Sunday, 18th of January, 9.41 a.m. to Alec. Subject, Operation Seaward. Dear Alec, I've just read your email from late last night, and I don't know what to think. Your stuff is safe with me, of course it is. Send as much as you like. But I feel I ought to tell you that since my breakdown, as everyone calls it, I've been seeing a psychiatrist who's been very helpful, and she warned me that something like this might happen, that I would start thinking the Roger stuff was all real again. Well, I am confused now, I can tell you. You've sent me two audio files of me talking to Roger. But all the rest of it, how do I know it's even true? To be fair, I looked up all the seaward stuff on the internet, so I know you're not making that up, at least. But please, don't draw me into this. I'm very fragile. This lady shrink the other day, she brought a fluffy kitten into the consultation room. She wanted me to be nice to it. She put the kitten on my lap. I said I don't have a phobia about cats. I just know how cats think. But she'd made her plan, and she was going to stick to it. What would you like to say to this lovely little innocent kitten, Wiggy? And I looked into its huge eyes, and it looked back at me. Go on, she said. Give it a stroke, Wiggy. So I did my best. I made a big effort to stroke its little furry head, but the moment I touched it, it turned round to hiss at me, so I shouted, Get off my lap, you bloody murdering bastard! You killed my sister! I'm sorry to hear about Winterton. I do believe you, but I don't want to. I hope little Watson was well and safe on your return. Of course, I've never met little Watson myself, and here I am caring about his welfare. What a twerp I'll feel if it turns out... He doesn't exist either. Wiggy. From Wiggy. Sent Monday, 19th of January, 5.14pm, to Alec. Subject, hello. Hello. Dear Alec. You're scaring me now, Alec. I've been checking for emails for the last five hours. Just a line would be fine. I just need to know how you and Watson... And Winterton are. Wiggs. X. From Wiggy. Sent Monday, 19th of January, 10.36 p.m. to Alec. Subject, Alec! Where are you? Alec! For God's sake! I'm going to pieces here. I don't know what to think. Please let me know what has happened. I haven't heard from you for two days. I've never met you, but I am your friend.
from Alec, sent Tuesday 20th of January, 6.03 a.m. To Wiggy, subject, none. Attachments, PDF, entitled, Seaward. Dear Wiggy, I'm sorry I didn't reply to your emails. I'm sorry if I caused you any distress. The thing is, Winterton is dead. And I don't want to be melodramatic, but I think this might be the last time you hear from me, so I want you to stop being weak about all this, because we don't have the luxury. Winterton is dead, and Joe is dead, and my own dear Mary is dead, and if I'm next, I have to know that you're not going to delete all this material and take a pill to help you forget it. Sorry to be harsh. I haven't slept much in the last seventy-two hours. The only positive thing is that I do have the pamphlet, and I've attached a scan for you to see. Also, the dog is safe, thank God. But any other news is not so good. I had a call on my mobile yesterday morning from someone who said he was Tony Bellingham. He explained he was that neighbour who called on me after Christmas at home, the one whose surname I've never taken any interest in. He said there had been a break-in at my house and I needed to go there at once. It was a bit of a mess, he said. He was with the police. I said I would go later, but I shan't. The last thing I want to do is go home. And then... When I got to the hospital, there were police in the ward, and they told me what had happened. In the night, Winterton had died, but nothing to do with his injuries or his blood loss. He died of suffocation. And they were saying it was murder. They said Winterton, under sedation, wouldn't have had much strength to push off his attacker. But the mystery was, how did the attacker get in? From what I could piece together, Winterton's room was on the ground floor. A window had been left partly open, but it was much too high off the ground for anyone other than a large, muscular cat, with powers, of course, to reach from outside, so they were ruling out anyone climbing in to commit the deed. But it was still murder, the nurse told me. At around 4 a.m., she heard the alarm from Winterton's heart monitor. She rushed in to find him blue in the face, all over the pillow. And all over Winterton were weird black hairs like animal fur. Whoever suffocated Winterton, she said, must have used a black fur jacket or coat to smother him as he slept. I haven't had time to read the Seaward pamphlet closely yet, but a lot of it looks so disappointingly lame and predictable, all hail Beelzebub, king of cats, that I nearly wept when I first opened it. To think... Mary and Winterton died for this. Talk about the banality of evil. If Seward was responsible for writing this, well, I'm sorry to swear, but he must have been a tosser. But I shan't give up. The main thing that caught my eye was on page 7, the list of grand catmasters, starting with Sir Isaac Newton in 1691. There are about a dozen names altogether, including John Seward, of course, and as you will see, Seward names his successor as well, which is very interesting. I didn't tell you how it went on Saturday night, but I expect you can guess. When I opened the emergency exit at 6pm, I found Winterton on the ground, already bleeding from the neck and head, screaming and thrashing about, with a dark shape on top of him. The sound of the klaxon alarm when I opened the door made the captain shoot off, but I saw him, Wiggy. I saw the captain's huge yellow eyes watching us in the dark of that dingy courtyard. I'm thinking of moving to a different B&B. I think it's sensible not to stay in any one place for too long. I'll send the address when I can, but for the time being, I'm going in search of the last grand cat master named on the list, because from what little I can deduce from the mumbo-jumbo all-hail rubbish in Nine Lives, he's the key to putting a stop to all this. I'd appreciate it if you would have a look at the last page of the pamphlet where there is talk of some sort of ritualistic device called a debaser that the cat-master holdeth. Something about a circle closeth. It makes no sense to me, but as you can imagine, it's hard to think straight right now. It's such a shock to have lost Winterton. I've had so many new perspectives to deal with in the last couple of weeks that I can hardly keep track of them all. For example, Mary didn't just die. Cats are murdering bastards. 
A load of black hairs on a suffocated man's pillow do not indicate an assailant using a black fur jacket. The library has been holding powerful cat occult bastard evil shit ever since I've worked there. And as for Julian Predo, just a few days ago, I was saying that he was the laziest librarian on the planet, and now I know from the list printed in the back of this pamphlet that he is the Grand Catmaster, appointed in person by Beelzebub, and has been so for fifty years, ever since John Seward hanged himself in the garden at Harville Manor on the 3rd of September, 1964. Telepathic message, also known as an e-meow, from Roger the Cat, sent Tuesday, 20th of January, morning, to Julian Predo, Grand Cat Master. Subject, All Hail, Grand Cat Master. All Hail, Cat Master. Roger here. May I approach thy presence, figuratively speaking, O great librarian and holder of the great debaser. From afar I cringe and fawn unworthily before thy almighty cat power, and all round top drawer diabolical connections, etc., etc., etc. Emiao, from Predo to Roger. Speak, Roger. This is an unexpected pleasure. Roger. Yes, I expect it is. Although I would appreciate it if you tried not to sound so bloody sarcastic. I just wanted you to know that I heard about Winterton, about him being polished off in intensive care by feline body surf asphyxiation. Are you upset? I expect you're upset. Of course I'm not upset. I'm furious. Roger, 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 if you want to make a formal complaint... What? To Beelzebub? Well, technically he is our line manager. Yes, and I wonder what he'll say when he finds out that, due to your incompetence, a librarian called Alec Charlesworth is now in possession of nine lives and intends to use it. Alec from periodicals? Look, if this is some sort of joke. No joke. Oh, my God! The idea of nine lives being in the hands of someone like Alec from periodicals. Roger, that book explains everything. I know it explains everything. Oh, Satan's appointed deputy. Including how cat masters themselves can be destroyed. Now look, don't threaten me, Roger. Beelzebub himself. Oh, sod Beelzebub. Roger! I'm going to help this periodicals man. He likes Tennyson, and he calls his dog after Dr. Watson in Sherlock Holmes. Roger, stop and think. You're rightly upset about Winterton. But haven't you known for years that the captain would get to him one day? The captain always blamed Winterton for taking you away from him all those years ago on the Acropolis. Even when you were both with Seaward after the war, Winterton was always in the background, wasn't he? The captain knew that. When you left the captain for a second time, when you chose to leave him, it really broke his heart. He'd already broken mine. No... It's over, oh great cat master. I'm old, I'm jaded. I worked it out last night, oh lord of all cat evil. All told, I've been responsible for the deaths of eight people. I'm giving you notice. I'm making it nine. You know you can't kill me, Roger. You can't kill the cat master. I can, if I read that book. (laughs) 
From Wiggy, sent Tuesday 20th of January, 8.45am, to Alec. Subject, Nine Lives. Dear Alec, I hope this reaches you. I have been reading this bloody pamphlet for hours now, and you're right about how absolutely tossy it is, but it's also weirdly plausible, you know. Remember that story you found online about the old man who lived near Harville Manor, whose cat came back with a physical aversion to songs of praise? I can't explain it, but I'm really bloody haunted by that. Alec, I have to tell you a couple of things, and I hope you won't be cross. In your last email, you mentioned you were going after the Grand Cat Master, but you weren't ever so specific, and I was just reading and re-reading that bit in the book at the end about the Great Debaser, and it suddenly occurred to me what it was. And I knew you didn't have it, and I thought you'd bloody well want it, if at all possible. I've never explained to you that by sheer coincidence... I live just three streets away from the library you used to work in, about the local Corkwick, as it happens. I never mentioned this before because I wasn't sure at first that I wanted to get involved. Anyway, I studied the library plan you sent me, and this morning I thought I'd bloody well risk it. So I got myself into the library on a rather clever research pretext, and after getting lost a couple of times I found Predo's office. He wasn't there. And I got it, Alec. I got the great debaser. No idea what to do with it now, of course, but I do have it in front of me as I write this. And I do feel proud. The other thing I have to tell you isn't quite such a positive type thing. It's that I've remembered that Roger said he knew how to access my emails. I'm really sorry, Alec. I mean, I've no idea if Roger has been reading every single thing you've sent me. But just in case, my advice would be, from now on, don't tell me anything important by email. W. X. From Alec, sent Tuesday 20th of January, 8.45am, to Wiggy. Subject, out-of-office auto-reply. Re-operation Seaward. I am currently rather busy and mostly away from my computer. If this is Wiggy... I am going to Harville Manor, but don't tell anyone. From Wiggy, sent Tuesday 20th of January, 8.48am, to Alec. Subject, you should change your auto-reply. Alec, you probably ought to change your auto-reply. Sorry, see previous email. Wiggs, X. A hundred yards short of the gateway to Harville Manor, I stopped the car in a lay-by under a street lamp next to an ancient wall, switched off both the engine and the windscreen wipers, and allowed the snow to settle slowly and silently on the glass. I undid Watson's harness and pulled him onto my lap and started to pull myself together, and then we both heard and felt it together, something softly landing on the roof of the car. If I had been sensible, I'd have started the engine and used the windscreen wipers and driven off smartly as well. But it wasn't just that I didn't want to see what was out there. I absolutely didn't want it to see me. From the roof of the car it jumped down and landed on the bonnet, the car bouncing a little, but not enough to shift the snow on the windscreen. Paralyzed, with one hand on the ignition key and the other across Watson's shoulders, I could make out the merest dark shape beyond the layers of glass and snow, moving from side to side. And then a huge cat's paw struck violently at the windscreen, and we both jumped in the air. The first strike was followed by a rapid volley of blows that shattered the caked snow and sent it flying in shards and revealed the captain. Huge and black and yowling, Get off my car! I shouted. I started the engine and the windscreen wipers, Undeterred, the cat continued to beat at the glass, his claws making bright white dents and pits. What were those claws made of, for goodness sake? And what could I do? My only option was to put the car in gear and gingerly move off. 
but the captain seemed to think nothing of balancing on the snowy, slippery bonnet of a slow-moving Volvo. He clung on easily and kept chopping and bashing at the windscreen, which was beginning to crack and fracture. On the slippery road, I revved the engine and drove fast towards the gateway to Harville Manor, and then made an abrupt turn, hoping the captain would be thrown clear by the sudden change in direction. But I lost control of the turn, and when the car slid to the right, it hit the right-hand gatepost broadside with considerable momentum. The captain shot off and hit a brick wall. The back door on my side caved in, and poor Watson was thrown sideways against the passenger door, and I have to admit, he screamed. The engine was miraculously still running, so I risked attempting to drive off. Where was the captain? There was no sign. Well, I will never forget the strange satisfaction of feeling the car mount a telltale bump on the road and drop down again. Halfway up the drive, I stopped and gave Watson a reassuring hug, but it was more for my own reassurance than for his. I need hardly say that running over the captain had not been part of my plan, but let's face it, I had no plan. But I soon forgot the captain in any case, because arriving at the house, I had my first sight of Roger, solemnly swinging his grey tabby tail, and I'm ashamed to say, my heart leapt. I got out of the car and sank an inch or two into the thick snow. Roger, I called. With three or four neat bounding motions, Roger descended to the ground to meet me. It was like a dream. Alec, he said. How on earth did he know me? I didn't care. He held out a paw. I bent down and shook it. His eyes were so green. No one had mentioned before the sheer beauty of Roger's piercing green eyes. Welcome to hell, he said, and laughed. We ought to get inside. We don't have long to get organized. Did you bring the dog? From inside the car, Watson barked. Ah, Watson, said Roger. Come at once if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. Five minutes later, we were inside the manor. Roger sat on a wooden sill and indicated features of interest near to the house. Watson I had tied up in a far corner, and he had finally stopped barking, which was a relief, because everything echoed spookily in this shell of a house. "'There's the old well over there,' said Roger. "'There's a story attached to it, of course, about witches, but it takes forty-eight minutes, so I shan't start.' "'What time did you run over the captain?' "'He said it as if he were inquiring what time I'd come through Dorchester. "'I'm sorry. "'You ran him over, Alec. "'It's okay. "'I just need to know roughly when you did it.' "'Well, it was just now. "'Good. "'So we've got about an hour before he comes back. "'He'll come back? "'Of course he will. "'That's why we're here, Alec.' Right. Yes. Pay attention, Alec, said Roger. The captain must be stopped, and the book you stole will help us. Seward wrote it all down, you see, how to dispose of nine life cats and their master for good and all. That's why the captain has been so desperate to get it back. Now, there are two stages to defeating the captain, the method for both of which is specified in Seaward's book. The point is, we must deprive him of both his powers and his immortality. The first requires us to employ the great debaser, which we might not have access to. But the second is more important in any case. I happen to know that all nine lifers lose their immortality if the great cat master is killed by one of his own cat minions. Roger took a deep breath and then said quietly, I have vowed to kill Predo, and I will do it this day. My mind raced. This was quite a big development. Didn't it mean that now Roger would be mortal himself? You know about Predo, 
he said, jumping down from the windowsill. Of course, you don't know everything about Predo, but my plan concerns him first, and then the captain, and then me. By the time Predo gets here, the snow on top of the captain's body will be quite deep, so with any luck, Predo will run him over again, giving us yet another hour of breathing space. This seemed a little cold-hearted. However, I was hardly in a position to judge. So first I need to see the pamphlet for myself, said Roger. You did bring it. I went to the car and retrieved Seward's pamphlet from the back seat. I'll gladly give you this, I said, when I returned indoors. If you'll fill in the gaps for me, Roger. You do know everything, don't you? Yes, said Roger. Yes, I do. I handed over the pamphlet. Expertly, he turned the pages with his claws and found what he was looking for. Ah, he said at last, it really is as simple as that. What does it say? I'd like to tell you, but it would take three days. I wish you'd stop saying that there isn't time to tell me things. I have to know more. That's why I stole the thing and drove down here. I sounded peevish, but I was too exhausted to correct my tone. Why did Joe have to die in that cellar? I demanded, and started using my fingers to indicate where I was on a long list of points. Why didn't you tell Wiggy where she was? What did the captain do to Mary? Why did you fall out with the captain when you'd been such very close friends? Why has the captain turned out this way? Roger seemed surprised by the intensity of my questioning. Winterton didn't tell you anything? I made a ha noise. Roger sighed. Look, Alec, I've got time to tell you this much. What happened at Shingle Cottage was this. Predo tracked me down. He's your master. He's my master. I've eluded him for decades, but in the end he always tracks me down. The captain helps him. It's been the same pattern over and over. I find a human I want to live with quietly. I start to tell my story, which is fairly lengthy, and I am always stopped by Predo one way or another before I can tell anyone the terrible truth of what happened here at Harville. What did happen here? Oh, Alec, Roger said with a catch in his voice. You don't want to know. All I can say is that it's sometimes involved, and here he found it hard to speak, it involved kittens. Seward was a monster, he went on. Predo worshipped him. He has given his life to preventing the truth of Seward's experiments from getting out. This time, having traced me to Shingle Cottage, he planned to snatch me away, and my greatest regret now is that I didn't just cooperate. But it got complicated. Joe spotted Predo prowling about. The binoculars, exactly. She made notes of dates and times, and then she started seeing that big cat as well. She got frightened, and I felt I couldn't leave her. And then you killed that poor little dog. I didn't kill the dog. Oh, Alec, I love that dog. Predo killed the dog because it was protecting me. When Joe found poor Jeremy dead, she got hysterical, and that's when I suggested she hide in the cellar next door. I thought she would be safe. Joe loved me, Alec. She begged me to hide with her, you know. But I was afraid it would make things worse for her if I did. My mistake was to scarp her. It was only after I was sure Predo had gone that I came back to the cottage and realized Joe was missing. I tried to get into the house next door, but it had been locked up. From the windowsill I could see into the kitchen, and I could see that a heavy trunk had been placed over the cellar trapdoor, making it impossible for Joe to get out. This was typical of Predo's sadism. 
He knew what it would be like for me, enduring Joe's slow death, knowing it was all my fault and powerless to help. It was three days before Wiggy arrived, and I know what you're going to ask. Why didn't Roger tell Wiggy where Joe was? Well, you're forgetting something, Alec. How long do you think it takes for me to break the news to each new person that I am a talking cat? By the time I could talk to Wiggy properly, the scratching noises had long since ceased. My lovely, brave Joe was most definitely dead. It would take a while for me to process all this. In the meantime, I had just one question. So why did you pee on the phone when it was charging? To destroy that terrible picture of the dog. Prido took the picture and replaced the phone on its charger. If any more proof were needed that I cared about Joe and couldn't bear what had happened to her, it's that I risked electrocution of the penis to destroy that terrible thing. Half an hour later, as darkness finally engulfed the house, we heard a car on the drive. We were relieved to hear the unmistakable kabump that meant we'd been let off getting swiped at by gigantic beastly claws for at least another sixty minutes or so. And in due course, Credo arrived at the house. When Prido turned his face to me, his eyes went red. His whole eyeballs were not only bright red, but illuminated like traffic lights. I was so startled that I giggled. This man can't have satanic eyeballs, I thought. He's a librarian. Roger, come here, said Prido. Approach. Roger turned his back on Prido, and then, with all four legs bent obsequiously low, he crawled slowly backwards towards Prido. It was something like moonwalking, and sat down demurely at his master's feet. "'Where's the captain?' Prido demanded. "'He said he'd be here before me.' "'He was detained, O oh great cat protector and servant of Beelzebub,' said Roger. "'But he isn't far.' Prido turned to me. "'You have two things that belong to me, Charlesworth,' he said. Two, I squeaked. "'Seward's book and the great debaser, and I want them now.' This time, when he flashed his red eyes at me, a spark of flame flew out and set fire to the floorboards. And then everything went swimmy, and I found I was gazing at Roger, his green eyes glowing almost as much as Prido's red ones. Just when things started getting truly interesting, I lapsed into a coma. When I woke up, things had radically moved on. From somewhere, Prido had found a sort of wooden throne, and was now seated on it with Roger on his lap, and he was making an incantation. But summoning the devil clearly wasn't going to plan, on his lap, Roger was purring. He tried to knock Roger off, but the cat clung on and purred more loudly, menacingly loudly. His purr, in fact, grew so loud and deep and resonant that I could feel the vibration in the floor, and Prido's throne was shaking. Watson, in his corner, started to bark. Meanwhile, the smoke was still rising and the wind still howling round the house, but Prido was no longer chanting. He had stopped abruptly, as if silenced by a greater power. The purr grew louder still and louder, and then Prido screamed. As I watched him, Roger started to make an exaggerated puddling motion in his master's lap, and suddenly a geezer of scarlet blood shot high into the air. Prido screamed as Roger's claws dug deep into his groin. 
Roger kept purring and paddling as his claws pierced and ripped Predo's flesh, tearing his life away. At this point, a large, dark figure began to materialize in the middle of the candle flames, a figure with unmistakable, goatish overtones. Master! screamed Predo. Master! Stop him! But Roger wasn't to be swayed from his grisly task. His claws dug deeper and deeper, and the almighty purr was deafening. Meanwhile, the huge figure continued to materialize within the circle. It began to look about it. It began to emit a smoky glow, and then bang! A great knock at the door echoed through the room, and the figure looked round in confusion. Watson broke free and hurled himself towards the door. Bang! Bang! The figure noticed me, lying on the floor, just as Watson turned round and noticed him. It was the worst moment of all. To see my brave little dog charging at the satanic figure, barking and growling, skidding and sliding on Predo's blood. No, Watson! No! I shouted. Bang! 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 And then it all happened very quickly. Just as the figure turned to deal with Watson, Roger leapt from Predo's lap onto the floor, smothered in blood, and confronted the apparition. Beelzebub, he said in a commanding voice. Their eyes met. Your servant is dying. Look. It was true. Predo's life was seeping from him on his throne. The apparition became instantly unsteady. It began to fade, dip, swirl, and hum. The force was like a helicopter out of control, spinning to its destruction. Bang! Bang! As we all turned to see who it was, the huge figure vanished, turning inside out, and thus Wiggy entered with perfect dramatic timing. But he had not come alone. Is this the captain? he said, indicating a large black bundle in his arms. Can you believe it? I found him in the road. I nearly ran him over. I got up off the floor, just as the captain leapt from Wiggy's arms and approached Roger on menacing tiptoe. His back hunched high, his tail swishing. Roger stood his ground, but it would have been clear to anyone he was no match for the captain in any conventional catfight. What have you done here, Roger? I've set us free. Who are these humans? Roger didn't answer. They circled round, tails thrashing. Occasionally, one of them would hiss or snatch at the air with their claws. I took advantage of the break in the cat dialogue to introduce myself. You must be Wiggy, I whispered. Yes, he replied. I got here as quickly as I could. Suddenly, the captain lashed out at Predo's throne and broke one of its legs. Roger didn't flinch. It's over, captain, he said. Don't you feel it? We shouldn't fight. It's over. Astonishingly, Roger dropped his fighting pose and sat opposite the captain. It was a very deliberate action, showing extraordinary intellectual control, and the captain watched him closely in some confusion. What's happening? I said to Wiggy. It looks like he's going to start telling a story. And so he was, in a way. For years and years, Roger said, addressing us all, all I've wanted is to tell my story. I told the first bit to you, didn't I, Wiggy? To Joe, too. Also to Michael, the potter. And to six other people. Every single time Predo prevented me from telling it all. So I have never told the rest of my story to a living soul. And now... He laughed effectively. Now I never shall. The things that happened here, the way the captain suffered here under seaboard. We both looked at the captain for his reaction. He relaxed his fighting position. He was listening. Seaward was a monster, Roger continued. But cats trusted him, the captain trusted him, didn't you, dear captain, with your simple nature? The black cat closed his eyes and hung his head. He used you, Roger added. A tear trickled down the captain's face. 
and he made you commit the ultimate betrayal. I know you resisted him. I know you tried. But in the end you let him try to ruin me, your own dear Roger, a cat you had created, a cat you had wept for. How long did you look for me abroad? Six years, said the captain, who appeared lost in sadness and remorse. Wiggy, did you happen to bring that little thing you found at the library? Roger said lightly. Oh, yes. Do you remember, Wiggy, that I talked about the captain's last words to me when he left me that morning? The captain broke in. I said, Roger... I'll always look after you. Roger approached the captain and put his paws on the big cat's shoulders. You gave me everything, captain, he said steadily. You showed me what a cat could be. But the price we paid for our immortality was subjection to the cat master, and now he's gone. Isn't there another cat master to take over? I asked. No. Predo was too arrogant to name one. The captain sighed. Do you remember when we were on a boat once, at night, in the Aegean? Roger nodded. It was the happiest moment of my life, the captain said. Over the captain's shoulder, Roger made a signal with his head to Wiggy, and Wiggy withdrew something from his pocket. It looked like a cat collar. Roger nodded. Wiggy reached down and stealthily put it round the captain's neck. Lost in emotion, the captain hardly noticed what was happening. Roger withdrew his paws from the captain's shoulders. Shall we all go outside? We reached the famous well. Roger jumped up on the stone wall the captain jumped up beside him. I'm so sorry about everything, Roger, said the captain. He then looked at me and Wiggy. Was it your wife I met in that garden in Cambridge? He asked me. I was seriously taken aback. I was only looking for Winterton. I just gave her a shock, I think. She fell down, and then she didn't move. What do you mean, I snapped. How did you give her a shock? Probably by saying, Hello, I'm looking for Winterton. Roger decided to retake control of proceedings. I have a few last words to say to you all, he said. He looked so beautiful in the moonlight. In a magnificent manner, he addressed us each in turn. Alec, Hamlet is right. A man's life really is no more than to say one. Wiggy, give up on the screenplays. Then he turned to Watson. Education never ends, Watson. It is a series of lessons with the greatest for the last. And with that, he placed his paws either side of the captain's neck once more. Then with the barest effort, he bent them both sideways over the well and they both fell in. Roger, no! I cried. Roger, no! yelled the captain as well, arguably with even more reason. But Roger had gone. With a magnificent final Watson address from Sherlock Holmes, he had taken the Reichenbach Falls way out. So that's nearly the end. I am back home in Cambridge now, and the adorable Watson is safely at my feet. It has become clear to me that until he killed Predo on that night in Dorset, Roger had never killed anybody. The eight previous lives, including Joe's, were all taken by Predo, either to prevent Roger from telling the terrible secrets of Harville, or to remind him who was boss. My dear wife Mary loved to read mysteries. I think I have mentioned how much I miss her. 
This has been written for Mary, with all my love. If I had written it in the conventional way, she would have guessed everything from about page six, because that's what she always did. This is not to say, however, that she wouldn't still have been two steps ahead of me, even with the story as it stands. She would have looked up from the manuscript, removed her old reading glasses, and said to me, reprovingly, Oh, bear.